Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to Dia's Readings and Contemporary Poetry Series. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco, and I'm an assistant curator here at Dia, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our reading tonight. So as many of you, I'm sure, already know, Vincent Katz is the curator of Dia's Readings and Contemporary Poetry Series. And for the past five going on six years, he's uh, brought a diverse group of poets here together at Dia Chelsea to share their work with one another and with us as the larger audience. So I'm particularly pleased to welcome our two poets for this evening's program. Uh, we have Joe Elliott and Sarah Jane Stoner. Thank you both. Thank you, both of you, for uh, generously agreeing to be a part of this series. I also want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Dominique Levy Gallery, who provides major support for these readings. Uh, additional support is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. We also want to thank Brooklyn Brewery for the complimentary cold beverages. And I want to thank uh, all of Dia's staff for their assistance with the coordination in the series, in particularly Francesca, Dan, Mary Catherine, Julian, Allison, and Claire. So following uh, the first reader, we take a brief intermission uh, before resuming with the second speaker of the evening. At that time, we'll have um, books available for sale by both of the poets, cash preferred, although we're flexible. And you can also grab a second drink if you'd like as well. So it's now my great pleasure to give a very warm welcome to Vincent Katz, who's going to introduce our first poet for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming. Good to see you tonight. Um, really excited about this reading, and I'd like to inform you of our next two readings for the season. On April 5th, we're happy to present Cecilia Vicuña and C.A. Conrad. And our final, re final reading of this season will be on May 10th, and it will be Rosemary and Keith Waldrop. So please come back for those. Joe Elliott will be our first reader. Joe Elliott ran a weekly reading series at Biblios Bookstore in New York for many years. He is the co-editor of two chapbooks, A Musty Bone and Situations, and is the author of numerous others. Granary Books published If It Rained Here, a collaboration with artist Julie Harrison, who's here tonight, in 1997. His poem, 101 Designs for the World Trade Center, was published by Faux Press as an e-book in 2003, and a collection of his work, Opposable Thumb, was published by Sub Press Collective in 2006. In 2010, Lunar Chandelier Press published Homework. For many years, Elliot made a living as a letterpress printer. He currently teaches English at Edward R. Murrow High School in New York and lives in Brooklyn with his wife and their three boys, although I think one of them is at college now. Okay. His, his wife and, and two boys. Well, he's here right now, so um, it's a process. <laughs> he has a poem about it, actually, that's pretty great. Maybe he'll read it tonight. Joe Elliott's poems feel like encomia on human realities, and they are that, but they slyly subvert their adopted genre at the same time, so his achievement is double. Not only is he able to revive the seemingly moribund forms of topical poetry, but he is able to make the reader or listener smile simultaneously. Thus, a poem bemoaning faking it in bed, that is, bemoaning that you are faking it, ends with envy for the real, the indescribably complicated ability to be simple and look someone in the eyes and fuck them truly. <laughs> Eliot is like a pre-Socratic philosopher able to turn simple truths on their head so that they still make sense but a different, more accurate, funnier sense. 
as in this short, untitled poem. God is a fish who lets himself, for us, be caught in a net of words. Pleased with ourselves, we carry him home in a tin bucket of a book and serve him up for dinner. Eliot is a master of rhythms and, and of forms, and they shift from one book to another. But always there is this sensibility, wedded to wisdom earned through living, that roots his poems to the ground. There's melancholy, too, but appreciation arrives just in time in the form of heightened awareness. Please help me welcome Joe Elliott. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. That was really, yikes. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to read mostly from this book, Idea for a B-Movie. It's, it's, it's still slightly warm from the box. Immediately following conception, everyone spends the loveliest half hour of one's life as a single cell before one begins to divide in two integrities. All right, I'm going to skip that. Fender glint, <clears throat> checking the rear and side view mirrors, engaging the directional and carefully accelerating out into traffic, taking care of these simple things, waiting with equanimity to make that long left hand turn into the lot behind the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, backing into a tight angled spot in front of the dry cleaners, to drop off a suit and some shirts, Come, coming to a careful stop out in the middle of the town hall parking lot to let the high school softball team clean your exterior with their sponges and hoses, double parking and putting on your hazards as you run in to drop off a few overdue books at the library by the playground, and then gliding up to the edge of the ball field where your son is waiting for you, getting out to help him in, getting to be the parent behind the wheel in the front seat while your child gets to be the kid buckled in in the back seat and the two of you get, getting to drive and talk or drive and be quiet together. It's forced togetherness in the car. It's like a good opportunity, right? A few years ago, I dressed up as my dead dad for Halloween. I put on a tuxedo and blew up a picture of him in his tuxedo and glued his bald head, his big open mouth, his crooked teeth, his jovial expression, and exuberant eyes to a paper plate and cut holes in it and made a mask. It was disconcerting how his whole face was a little too big and looking to the left, but what was even scarier was how I knew the people we'd meet trick-or-treating would have to ask about my costume and I would get to say, I'm my dead dad, as if it were a piece of performance art and my emotional life were some kind of joke, something to make a display of in mind for its irony. Even though I really did and do miss him, how he was always there for me, withholding and teasing, talking sideways, avoiding eye contact, concocting provocations, modeling for me how to make fun as one walks around one disaster after another. That's a true story. <laughs> all right. Climbing all over each other. My horsing around with you expresses a joy that implies a connection to an identical but infinite horsing around joy that I need. Everything is good. Everything is all right. Why don't you climb up on my back, he said, and I'll make silly celestial twinkling sounds, the sounds of stars, the sounds implied by the mere idea of those tiny, tiny animals down there climbing all over each other. All right. This is called intimacy. I always leave the front door unlocked and the kitchen lights on. 
I make sure the Mr. Coffee's set up and put a plate of oatmeal cookies out on the counter and leave a note. Help yourself. There's cream in the fridge and a sugar bowl next to the stove. Anne's mom's silver is on the top shelf behind the, above the sink. We hardly use it. The home computer is sleeping in the office off the hall upstairs, and our password, a scramble of names and birthdays, is scribbled on a post-it affixed to the windowsill. My laptop's charging on the kitchen table. The flat screen TV, of course, is hanging in the living room, the dark open area you just walk through to get to the kitchen. My wallet and anything I found in my pockets today is in a tray on top of my bureau in the bedroom at the top of the stairs. Anne's jewelry box is on hers. If it makes you feel more comfortable, you can go back outside and use the ladder I left leaning against the eaves in the back. From there, you can get in the open window quite easily. But before you enter, may I suggest you pause and turn and have a look at the night sky floating above the willow's silhouette. Tonight should be a full moon, too. Or perhaps you'd prefer the alleyway, where a crowbar rests against a half window to the basement. It is quiet there and dark, and you can work in peace. And the sound of clattering glass in the middle of the night is a pleasure difficult to frown on. I do not hide cash or valuables under mattresses or bur bury them in the back of closets, although you're welcome to turn them over or dig through them to your heart's content. My passport is in the top drawer of my desk. The car keys are hanging on a hook by the front door. If you are confused by the location of anything, or if you feel the need to ask any questions, or above all, if you find yourself at any time feeling uncomfortable or scared or ashamed or bad in any way, please feel free to nudge me gently on the arm and wake me up to talk about it. You don't want to carry that stuff around. <laughs> all right. This is called Sleeping Soundly. This is like a Hurricane Irene poem. Irene's the one that preceded the bigger one, right? Three joint, three joint compound buckets on our bed. Under the strategic places, I poked holes to keep the rainwater from building up and soaking through and sagging the whole ceiling sodden, suddenly collapsing on our bed of vows. Instead, Anne, out cold and then hot and cold again in a mass of bedding twisting between buckets and me on my back on the throw rug in the alley between bed and wall, my head almost out the door, listening to the music of the three buckets, their three distinct levels of water, their shapely plinks and plunks, thinking how to stay married, you need a hammer and a hole punch and the ability to sleep through anything and anywhere. That's, that's not advice I got at couples therapy. <laughs> Some houses do not have a cellar. In that case, it could be a garage or an attic or even a closet. Wherever you store that stuff, you might need later. You must go there with the lights out. You must feel your way along the wall and sit down in the middle of all of it and wait. All right. All right, I'll read this one. I, I uh, write a lot of poems like um, in response to something, of course. And as like a younger member of a big family, I, I was the one that got to um, uh, uh, wise off to my, my dad. Uh, talking back as a way of coming back to life. Talking back, you need the prior version to talk back to. You need the leg of an animal for your own leg to become animate. You need the compressed sedimentary accumulation of millions and millions of years of tiny souls to put a tiger in your tank, to depress your pedal, engage your gears, and drive to Sea Town to buy that leg. Do you remember when Exxon was Esso? Put a tiger in your tank? All right. It's not an illusion if you tell it, Mr. Elliot, okay? A good perch. <laughs> oh my God. No, I'm gonna read this one now. Okay, we're getting off the book. We're going right to, I wrote this last summer. It's called How to Run for President. 
Thank you. No, no, not me. Not me. When traffic slows as you come to the crest of the white stone bridge and from that terrific height gaze east at the bays and coves that are the very beginning of Long Island Sound and west to the sublime skyline of Manhattan, a distant and manageable Manhattan of dreams, and then north into the sprawl of the Bronx, you realize something's not quite right, something's a little different. Down below near the foot of the bridge, what had been a hideous expanse of discarded tires has become a rolling green landscape, a few saplings here and there. Looking closer, you see a, there are tiny people down there too, a, and little open vehicles a few of these tiny people are traveling in. And then you notice a huge white sign embedded in a green hill facing us on the bridge, Trump links, apparently. This blight abutting the tolls, this excrescence of late capitalism, this habitual eyesore and sign of despair and waste has been turned into a golf course of all things. And that is when you begin to see into his mind how he knew that you would be stuck in traffic coming over the bridge, that you would be irritable and restless from the stress of the highway and longing for release, that the height of the bridge would give you a momentary high, that the pleasing sight of the sound and the city would make you feel that you were going somewhere, that you were someone special, someone with a huge name on a green hill for everyone to see. All right. This is called a good perch. The birds did not alight on his shoulder because of the halo. They did not see a universal sign of saintliness and therefore hastened to this beacon of exemplary peace and simplicity, as humanly attractive as these qualities may be, and then lovingly coo in his ear. It is more likely that he was so inward and still, so lost in the present, just standing there in the rain and sun for hours and hours, that they mistook him for the branch of a tree, or the top of a wall, or fence, or rock, and so landed on his sturdy shoulder, simply because it afforded them a good perch, and purchase for which, to his credit, as he did not understand it or anything as transaction, Francis did not make them pay. Thus, the halo, in honor of his utter lack of humanity, his wholesale inability to respond, his unwillingness to simply swat or shoo or even flinch or mutter a word, was conferred on him by the birds themselves when they flew about his head in a whirr to show the faint glow of the inanimate that they can everywhere see, but we cannot. That's a Catholic poem. Love. Just before the collision, the two celestial bodies, as they near each other, more and more veer out of their approximate but separate orbits directly at each other, obeying the law of attraction, seeking the center of the other, giving in at the very last moment to commitment, abandoning any and all notions of accident. The empty winter woods, birds still able to see for lack of leaves, the louder, more musical stream thrums over icicled roots and rocks, the world as cavity, the chest as drum. The more you think you lack, the more lack you think you have. All right. This is called Why Buses on Longer Routes love each other and tend to clump. <laughs> You'll see. All right. The bus that already has more passengers begins to slow down because it needs to make more stops to let this greater number of passengers off, but because it's slowing down and beginning to run a little bit behind schedule, the passengers waiting for this bus to arrive at last begin to accumulate more and more at each stop. 
so that this same slow bus begins to slow down even more. Every stop, it stops at five or 10 or even 15 passengers waiting to squeeze on or off so that it takes this bus longer and longer to load and unload, the aisles beginning to crowd with the passive aggression, the passengers' attitudes beginning to erode, the spiritual and mutual respect and cooperation more and more beginning to ebb and as this embarking and disembarking of passengers becomes a longer and longer trial, more filled with muttered interjections and askance glances, with the close odor of damp clothes, with crying children held by wrists. Meanwhile, the buses behind this bus that has begun to slow down have begun to speed up more and more, to run a little bit ahead of schedule, since that same bus slowing down ahead of them has begun to pick up a greater number of passengers from each stop at which they begun to accumulate. Certain passengers lining up on the long line to get on who would have made this bus, who wouldn't have made this bus at all if it had been still on schedule, but would have had to wait for the buses behind this one to pick them up, so that there's fewer and fewer passengers for the buses following the slower one ahead to be picked up so that their loading and unloading takes less and less time, so that the second and third buses begin to catch up to this first one that has slowed down so much more and is now way behind schedule, so that the distances between the one ahead and the ones behind have begun to decrease, and all of the buses may even be able to see each other from a distance just a few blocks away, looming in the rear or side view mirrors, their slower one in front now stopping for quite a while at every stop on the block, while the one behind may already have begun to skip over a stop or two, since the passengers waiting at a stop may already have been picked up by the bus in the lead, which at this point can hardly be said to be moving at all. And since there's less and less distance between the buses, there's less and less opportunity for new passengers to accumulate at each stop between the three buses. Although the ones ahead of the three now throng, an unhappy thickness of passengers glancing at watches, checking phones, craning necks, squinting down the avenue to see if the appointed bus or any bus at all is on its way. Or likewise, there may not be enough passengers on the buses behind waiting to get off to warrant a stop. There may not be a certain passenger waiting to get off at a certain stop, so that certain stop is skipped, eliminating that time that might have been spent disembarking or embarking so that the buses behind draw closer and closer, less and less behind, so that pretty soon the three are only a stop or two away from each other, are traveling in clumps, the first one overloaded standing room only, the second one having a few seats open, only two or three passengers standing here and there in the aisle, the third one nearly empty, careening after the first two, trying to catch up. The B-68, there's the B-68, all right. All right, all right, I'll read this one, here we go. The parent, my parents were at the hospital. They were standing in their street clothes on either side of the bed, which was empty. They were not looking at the bed, which was unwrinkled and smooth, but at each other. I could hear them talking about how I was going to be reborn how they therefore had to rename me and were thinking about Daniel, which I've always felt was a weird name. I wanted to say something, but the bed was newly made and the sheets were tight, pressing down on my mouth and face, which weren't even there yet, so I couldn't wriggle free or say a word. You can see I'm, I'm going too fast here. Today, I thought of giving myself the gift of not worrying about what people think, even what I think, just doing what presents itself to do, maybe even enjoying the little bits of it, what I couldn't have thought to think of. All right. I'll read this one. This is called The Idea for a Bee Movie since Carl's here. A week ago, I opened the fridge. When I reach in to grab the milk, I notice a puddle on the shelf. I check the bottom of the carton. It's moist, but it's difficult to see where it's seeping from. So I pour a little into my coffee, wipe down the shelf, and put the carton on a saucer and back into the fridge. Problem solved. 
Three days ago, I carry a bag of groceries into the kitchen and set it down on the counter. When I take hold of the milk to put it away, it gives a little. And when I swing it across the kitchen to the open refrigerator, the carton caves in and wriggling out of my grasp, falls to the floor at my feet. A pure white puddle begins to spread over the linoleum, silently nosing its way under the stove. I run to get a towel. Yesterday, I'm walking back from the store. I'm behind Carl. I notice the bottom of his backpack is dark and damp. Its back corner is dripping onto his socks and calf. He stops and starts to pull things out. The Wayfarers by Newt Hompson is a pulpy mess. His Yankees cap hangs sodden and shapeless. The screen of his digital camera is now a milky, non-functional white. The carton itself, which appears to have unfolded and flattened itself out in the pack, Carl now hurls to the sidewalk and mushes beneath his shoes. <laughs> At this very moment, all over the world, cartons are coming undone and cool milk is escaping, <laughs> pooling, gathering strength and spreading, running through open doors, seeping into and whitening whatever gets in its way. <laughs> all right. This is kind of similar, but this is, this is for this guy, Jim Kiernan, who taught math. Off the board, out the window. If those two parallel lines that are traveling forever out past the illusion of the blue bowl of the sky into space, out past anything that might offer even a little resistance, past particles and air, past heat and distance, and any meaningful sense of self and other towards some tiny twinkling they see, but which has ceased along with time to exist, were to bend and meet and break themselves up, and these resulting individual segments were to curl and knot themselves into curious shapes, and these curious shapes were to arrange themselves into words and lines, they might look like this. All right. Oh, here's one, early March, so it's topical. <laughs> After a day of hallways and classrooms of industrial tiling and intercom announcements of constant and close fluorescent interactions, the beautiful cold blue evening sky, the strange illumination of clouds, the faceless distances and the slight epiphany of green and debris wherever the silver snow has receded, wake me on my way to the car. <laughs> Satori. Okay. Oh, whatever. Okay. All right. We're going to go to debtor's blame. I know I owe you a lot, but I cannot pay you back when you keep sending me back to prison. Oh, it's a closed system. All right. All right, here's another bus poem, but it's from the other point of view, I guess. All right, it's shorter. Thank God. Evening. Standing on Coney Island in Foster, halfway out into traffic, looking down the avenue, searching for some sign in the oncoming pattern of lights for the B-68, wondering how on earth it could be so late, imagining the bland face of the fat dispatcher indifferent to my fate, here on the corner, forgotten and small, disrespected and screwed again. It occurs to me that maybe all of this isn't an insult to me. Maybe I am an insult to all of this. Maybe this fluidity of traffic, these glinting streetlights, this pulsing white noise of engines and horns, these particular people in particular hats accumulated in the corner and then releasing, pushing forward, maybe the high-speed bicyclists, the strange signage, the mothers in long grain coats and shopping bags swinging from strollers trying to get home, maybe even these thoughts I am having, this tense resentment that clenches my chest is existence herself. Maybe I'm already riding on the undulant surface of her skin as she strides down her avenue on her errand, and I don't have to wait. Ooh, ooh. All right. Taking off your clothes in a hurry and then putting them back on in a hurry. 
You don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to be in that situation. Okay. All right. All right, just a couple more. All right. When you go to get a new pencil from the place you get new pencils from, but have not looked for the old one you were using the night before, haven't even thought of looking for it, what you think and write with that new one will be immeasurably less ground down and true. That's like a rant to my teenagers. <laughs> that's a rant, though. You know, that's pretty good for a rant. Okay. All right. I'll just, okay, we'll try this. Instead, some people do not think about the value of a tree, how long it takes to grow, how it cleans and freshens the air, the deep shade it affords in summer, and how it takes the bite out of the bitter winter winds. They are unenthusiastic about the prospect of spending a spring afternoon gazing at pink blossoms or raking leaves and plucking fruit in the fall. They are unmoved by the sounds of proximate life, the chittering of squirrels and birds nesting in its upper branches, and the long-term benefits this chattering can have on the heart, and afraid that someday a heavy rain or wind or sudden crack of lightning may cause the tree to fall and cave in their bedroom roof or crush their minivan or raise their insurance premiums, they cut it down. They do not think to cut down the house and take to the tree. The tree is made of wood, too. And surely its warm, wide arms would be willing to gather them up as well. Instead of another instead poem, I guess this is what you do. You just go, oh, instead, I don't like reality. Instead of that, this. Instead of adjusting the speed of your gear to engage the gear closest to you, which in turn engages another gear or even several others neighboring it and so on, fanning out into a fu functional complexity of which your gear may feel in its inertial contribution a part, but whose infinite and deeply dispersed intention it can hardly glimpse. You take a more lonely pleasure in its disengaged perfection of shape, its wild spinning in place, its unencumbered teeth. Okay, we're getting there. Grand Theft Auto 5, Walter has a cold. Earlier I asked Walter to get off, and it seems like he's off because you can't hear the car crash and the trash talk and the guns going off. But when I look up from my grading, he's still in front of the screen, headphones on, and a man is holding up a store, and it's from his point of view. Even from across the room, you are the gunman, and you point it at the store owner, and when he reaches for something under the counter, you shoot him once in the chest and once in the head, and his blood splatters on the wall and the counter and the register, but the sound is off, completely off, so that what you hear is the click of a mouse and Walter breathing. All right. Politics. George, what? Did you brush your teeth? No. Go brush your teeth. Dad, what? Do you know who brushed their teeth? Who? Hitler. Hitler brushed his teeth. <laughs> Good, George. Go brush your teeth. Dad, yes. Do you know who brushed their teeth? Who, George? Stalin. Stalin brushed his big white teeth. Good, George. Go brush your teeth. Dad. What is it, George? Do you know who brushed their teeth? Who, George? Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden brushed his teeth. Really? He brushed his teeth? Every day. Good. Go brush your teeth. Dad. What is it now? Do you know who never brushed their teeth? Who? Jesus. Jesus never brushed his teeth. <laughs> And what happened to him? <laughs> now that, that's George. Hardly a word changed. All right. Tent as poem. Dear Mayor Bloomberg, 
because the erection of a modest tent city in a small private downtown park can in no way even begin to scratch, let alone dent the steeply mirroring global guns and money walls these flimsy temporary dwellings do protest. And because those sleeping unplugged from the global money and guns openly in bags at the very bottom of this unsunny canyon are like the sudden and scattered emergence of mushrooms among the shadowy roots of a climax forest's odorous floor after a light rain the night before, then it must be a merely symbolic act of free speech. Then these ropes and pegs and poles and fabric fluttering in the wind and rain are actual words emerging from the mouths of habitats, if not babes, and therefore must be protected, as any civil, civic right would, by any good citizen or mushroom gatherer of the world. Thank you. Sincerely, Mr. Elliott. Thank you. Born and raised in Fort Collins, Colorado, Sarah Jane Stoner holds an MFA from Indiana University and is pursuing a PhD in English at CUNY Graduate Center. Presently, she serves as the reviews editor for the Poetry Project newsletter. Her work has been published in the journals Diagram, Fence, Esk, and the Poetry Project newsletter. Her first book, Experience in the Medium of Destruction, was published by Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs in 2015. Regarding her academic work, she writes, I am writing essays about teaching, its immateriality and relationship to abjection, how subjects are produced in conventional classrooms, and thinking about what kinds of resistant writing and writing subjects disrupt, queer, or radicalize that subject production. She's experimenting with modes of thinking about how the poetics politics of a subject, as it might emerge in the collective environment of the classroom, allows us to manifest a poesis politics of the self in relation, in writing and in the world. Today, the 28th annual Lambda Literary Award finalists were announced and Sarah Jane has been nominated for an award. This is a really big deal, and so I'd like to read you a short description of what that entails. The Lambda Literary Awards celebrate achievement in lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender writing. Submissions come from major mainstream publishers and from independent presses, from long-established and new LGBT publishers, as well as from emerging publish-on-demand technologies. The winners will be announced at a ceremony on June 6th. Sarah Jane lives in Brooklyn with Madness, her cat. <laughs> How queer it is to body the loss, inescapable, that should level. This first line from a note to Sarah Jane Stoner's book, Experience in the Medium of Destruction, can serve as a harbinger for what is to follow and a motto for her work thus far. To body the loss, as she writes, implies receiving it, incorporating it, and therefore living with it. It should level, destroy, or create a level playing field, but does not. Even though it cannot be avoided, loss does not have the final word, which is the first word, queer. She writes in prose, but is understood to be a poet not simply because she circulates among poets, speaks and eats poetry, but because her sentences, for all their dizzying intelligence, do not make sense, but rather partake of the glorious continuous necessity to stop making sense. In that, they are a refuge from normality, from job, from academics, from politics as it is presented, from the straight world in general. Quote, poetry is a kind of fatigue in poetry, she writes. Poetry is always an exception, even to itself. Elsewhere, she cites Fernando Pessoa and really drifts into poetry's non-syntactic, unpunctuated realm. 
And she can tap into a poetics as experimental and unmoored as the farthest reaches of Joe Chiravolo, as in this passage. My land mass, sure, you sat my sum. Limes peel mutts, lie days, fan heaven. Deeds spite fleeing. The woman cut my hay to sigh haze. Yet there is tenderness in this book as well, surprising to the speaker as to her listeners. Her most recent work is thrilling in the mastery of its experimental rhythms. Hopefully, she will read some of that work tonight. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Jane Stoner. Happy International Women's Day to you. Happy New Moon Solar Eclipse to you. For those of you that matters for, it's a big one. Um, gosh, Joe. I feel like so tender in this particular area that I'm not normally tender, and it's your fault. Um, I wasn't gonna read from my book, but I'm gonna read from my book because I feel like celebrating today. And um, much thanks to Brenda, as always. Um, I, uh, yeah. How we are made by what we are trying to undo all the time. Um, I'm gonna read the first piece from the book. Uh, it's called The Opposition. Official communications scream much excellence. Word a maker of a shut up, shut down. Blank phonemes out from lofty tower cast bodies of interest beneath. Sounds between senses of the word, what of your interest? My tits possess an inexhaustible feeling toward getting between what you need for that, that two-faced hash cloud of money language men brokers of brokenest abstraction, most excellent. Arterial school narrowing out the living, we beat and breathe into more narrowing, even with our elbows out, 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 because due to an earlier incident, they have broken everything loving toward consolidation of command. What is the value of your subject? She is advocate assemblage of state of usefulness, state of abandon. Anyway, kind of shits the unicorn into the air, blows out the bowels of the subject, printed surface smeared. Cave girl lost machine, wallow wallowing. I say, we have a strangeness, and the best way for you to contain it is love. I say, what here is the authority to help? I would fuck everyone for you, including myself. Excellence is a kind of fatigue in education, is a kind of fatigue in learning, exact plans for a golden room at the top of a bullshit castle, the base bricks of which be burning objects of the subject turned object, a certain kind of glistening with dull heat kind of object, accentuate the erotics of showing you to your ignorance. Gender is a kind of fatigue in the self, is a kind of fatigue in the self. A lurch roll effort, scatter of body to contain the violence of our language, our ingenuity in time, a slide into forms, our making sense between the hot houses, i.e., fuck you, I am a flower. Our universe, I am tired, but more tired of these false rigors, these dumb micro-knit sweaters, suited shoulderings of space called men, and I find the simple idea of what kind of woman will you no longer accept them catching the nightmare in the high-necked dress of a sensible hemline, high-low, low-high. Here is a drawing of an apricot in your pocket. There is an apricot in my pocket, apricot in your pocket. The give, firm, slick of fuzz, cervical glands, what? Enough. Poetry is a kind of fatigue in poetry, a gradual erection of a perceptual facade that people come to rub out of a need for symptomatic ends, plush mirrors, louche attaches, default nation. 
Baraka says, you will, lost soul, say beauty. I say, to a certain brand of pretty flesh, house of conceptualisms, nouveau realism, nice jacket, nice purse, says Dumbo's feather of psychoanalysis, and I have a problem with bags, the magnitude of rent, and I will not naturalize it as my face ages. The human resource is a discount, a deal, no scene, poetry, a twilight of drugs, headed toward the marvel of warmed over parenthood. Someone holds a Christmas for the essential and the blocks deepen and I am ill. The subject is illness and a reaching backward toward some inexperienced life fingered ear. A rough patched widened stance, drop the cleaver with your massive self, saddle the spurt cleft, the chemical reach of oceans and your shifting and the way you talk about shopping, about onboard computers, about your purposes in love, make of me a druid a gummy avatar that feeds on its own difference and shrinks incredibly the poetic economy, materially a history of names associated with each other, power, a feeling of goodwill, an anesthesis, a marketable unknowability that accumulates what action remains is usually sitting, a room full of snow globes and storm season. We need light. We need a diagnosis of light. Discrete subjects have always been a trick like nouns, like names, a facility with vehicular manslaughter. A line accumulates outside a locked door behind which poetry has been accumulating, busy, busy conditioning itself, missed the possibility that our condition is no longer poetic. But anyway, your teachers are eating themselves in front of you. Their wastes are curricular. Students, your teachers are butt-smoking the canons of their peculiar avants in the incidental off-hours of your shared presence. They can almost see you for all the pain of their own knowledge. We feast on epic farts in the rooms of such assignment. Here I, here is composed decomposing of a longing to consume itself in the other's partial consumption of me, made and making in a millipedian embrace of you, ours, the immaterial labor of receiving us wet mouths out of blank ventriloquy. You, beautiful creature, train me. How we break forward and the self-same shore is eaten out of its own constitution. Suck the word and sprinkle its remains in a process that is out there, in here. You teach me and I am learning abeyance. Survival being, I am holding myself at bay. What are you is the only question for everything. And oh, I am rooting for the feral in you as it rises, fecal and lavular, on up into your intelligence, my pleasure. All who come bear bloody knives, the smell of which monsters me into a hole from which I speak, where the sounds curl into the fail, my chiasmatic dump axis lover friend. I love your bloody knives. I love you. I love your eaten away fingers, your weaponized face, your broken gender. If we could only feel it break with me, feel into it breaking, I sing to ourself, feel into it breaking in your fingers, your face. Because toward what empires of what do we own these bodies, ministers, oral flair, institutors, body read, machinists, eye of black, eye of blue, nationalists, blood of fuel. Each day you're born and the country of your feeling slips away to seek out bread and water. And I watch you shave off the signifiers of your most fecund psychosis. Oh, this is fresh. She's really fresh. This is how I love myself. This is how I love myself. I shit on your shoes. If I can't reach them, I draw their shit image on the glass between us. And I give your giving of the leash away. This is how I love myself. I arranged for my birth to occur through the anus. It took about 14 years. <laughs> Takes all kinds. <laughs> Forms of aggression. Take yourself, and then take a sieve, and take a pop star, and take a membrane stretched over speed. Swing it hard into that perfect wall while he watches and sweats. 
Light a joke on fire. Train a tree around your nightmare, the one that eats you. Wash that never been a baby in the snow. Walk slowly, slow, slowly until you stop. Sing a song while they shower nearby, talking about the one that got pissed on with so much joy. Pitch your song at that joy until you get it in your mouth and swallow slowly, so slowly, so you can hear it all the way down. Soak the rice. Soften the coal in your armpits, yes. Pass through the garden on your hands and knees. Pick herbs using only your mouth. Look for the light that signals you to lie down and rest. Then follow the cows to the water. Find a good hole and whisper to it all night long. Array all of the paint. Shatter the tea set in my dead-ended alley. Leave a lung on the sidewalk. Maybe kick it for a good measure. Gather all the words in a barrel. Skin yourself. Shoot the words in the barrel. And then hush. Indictment. I took the lowing ocean to your footstep, spread it, laid it out between the knot, knot of us, and what all of the qualm danger and the distance guarantee you require of me, of this erotic she, or what you thought its sterling was, and I thought winnow, blanch. I saw the water palm and heave beneath you there, retract, muscular, feather with some air, cough up a kind of bone, a bone-shaped bone, a bone shaped like a father. But it was the shadow of some lesser fish, valedictory I haven't studied. So fuck all wouldn't know. Your knife you drew, what knife it wasn't, real or unreal either. Saw your sharpened start, and there were shifts in my air, and children filled there with your needles, and I wept with your elegance, and I laughed with your serious, traced your patterns in a thousand drabbles, a nasty foam, my lowing ocean darkened at your patterns. There was a cry when you sliced me open with your pattern to seize that bone of yours what was and always ever for of yours, always until you're downed. You sliced me open and you found me. I was missing that rib and I was never your rib. When the singing entered, the over underneath had always been a filth, singing century of I was my own jugal bone, not never your rib. So you made a carnage that confirmed you as some sort of woman. You birthed a terror for yourself and burned a home into yourself of it. My blood said, look at us. All of us children, I ask you, do you suffer that blindness that saw your face on all the children? Look again, my blood, and you will find them all gone. And I have bled for years like a woman, so sad. It said, so sad, your aging body will hide from you in fear. This one's untitled. It cannot be a new language of blows, or a razor edged point of intersecting ultimatums. Fuck all parts of speech. Silence dreams of listening. What else to kill the unforced grace of power than to host 
hoist the electricity across forever failed binarisms, tra trap the unthinking civil, reverse the discourse exact, a silence, pr produce a humble, pr produce a weight that excavates, that translates the impossible bone meal, become grass, become birds, become biped, what centuries of violence, what today, what lives in the money that made that thing you sleep in, what lives in the bones you've been given, is it a language of nose, closed closures, bottoming out to take the center, to, to rearm, to, to remember, Show how many poets, how many good people, how many would take that job, have taken that job, have taken up that word, are living in a burying, are burying the living. Okay, Woo. this is my last one, and it's called Grief Hour. Seduction of refusal to make shift anything in place of the purchase of denouement of object of the church that opens up beneath the no lit by this internal planetary fire. Mouths open flares for that impatience honey heart tool, he says, sounding face with the sound of this light speech. At 200 miles, I see your ambivalence preparing, those memories edging the meat, bearing the shit of this present I am trying to hold. This is a gratitude malfunction. The good opening has been downed, despite an okay in longer matters. Title of window baby cunt conferred in the fog of what's partially wrong. It's been toward this ugly apart that we rememorize easy listening to forget the flooding of that other mother cocktail through our couldn't sour being, I've got mine. Now, dead places asshole us some practice, really, in meeting fear. Dampen a style stupid for the grace. Be loved, align others' sight to grown ideas. A different tell now and a bald we ethics recountable. That place that meets shit and dies in real belief performances. Naked in the unless sunlight. A cruel whir mangle of love work, less reality good and something flying petty. Broke a think up, more stroke imaginary, wrong up the noises. You so stunning when self-interested. Receive front to back. Fall down, man, these worthy momentaries. Even more, don't tears sub in your ache of crisis. You're identifying anyone out into me, a sometimes presence shared sick to throwing. That feminine, a flattened hole to we organize for to crash the now mind when I feel your like as the least feel, when deepering is knowing the distribution of the old she in the object something weight. Glint along me, cowboy, cross cowgirl, write the music. I burned the rope and all the lying fruit, such fruit desired, a greeting thronging at, to go at in an image, luster deep but assembling, weeping crowd-like but solitary with your mind. You were never, you were never not, but we are here together. Speak with me. I reheat a feeling and fall down past the floor, deepen those senses in the shit of your whole stalker box. Fix on desire inside mistrust, fix on it, watched you or made little eye girl noises, only fanning of yet. Demons are a wise mirroring that status all with the managing of who is slashed from the national, who dies where. Acute spike of laugh, art of the butcher, humane, a cold herd face of open. She takes my chilled secondary, losing spells same, mistress not granted. So we bend the snow bone south, cry to breathe deeper and take it in. That death, sister, that death absorbed and lost calculated as a call continuation. Good. So we are bad, refusal, guilt clear, and still backing like lethal. Good into the square that stones animals, cuts these eye sparks on the fallen weapons the men inside would candy for when asking how time likes their own wrongdoing, narcissism bright. We'll wetten your presence. 
not I'll wave many to prefigure something into a blazing tone, also into, and I help, I help, I help arrive a woman. That violence is not a mirror, a mountain contact mistake to talk water around others first, talk water to a furnace, to bleed green for fascist infants punctured by some rusty old moral sword now wielding it. Touching the auto-fetishist makes the segment feel soft. Sharing her confusion in a substance on my hands, the imaginary practice of me that could be palpable hot, could be loosened before the hands were myself. Buddha to me showtime. I'll put that fucking luck ladder anywhere I like. Like, bear all of my be kind. Rationalize forth, and I'll smell it after we shake hands, shape its center, and collapse for ink in the somehow arousal. You gaze into me and locate that carousel of images titled The in the universe of never. Rewrite as for a caller on random touch how casts beam for the just. When your focus at rising is rejection, the mess. She a self for conversation am sauce. A hard here applaud that mirror for the mouth coil. A finale brittle as affection has remained. Of, of, or heat. I strip, I am braid, that for a little holy look at me, consent to see attack of the colonial man guard. I spiral for that little robot, so culminating caught, got trying honesty should actually across. Lust how just involved down soft and spurred a strange missiles, longing power dreams. My commune is an inside of flexible talk that curls a tip into lukewarm between and a deep finger drags the boulder through your brush paint pull. This is masturbation to someone. Someone comes, you said. All letters inspire debt. Flow for a jar fist, your distance off. Someone intermittently, it's medicine. Throat a while to rounder and light something loaded in a house of parental work as hard. And I was watching you make me feel sexual. I was a spectator from my own body in the smear of purpose, rim in each stay. Tell monster something, colorful soft. What face circulates? What called cross promotion? We'll get all of in eventually, in without these bullshit holidays, receiving cuts for others' wounds. Accept, accept just, gather your dead, and reckon the remains of the burnt triangle that was this unfixed knowledge toward love. <laughs>